before we begin you know the lockdown is over almost and uh, all the smaller ones are still occurring in spurts you know around the country to check the pandemic but uh, if we think about it there were quite some unbelievable scenes of empty roads and everything shut you know for almost two full months and they were quite an eyesore and possibly the only oasis in that desert was the friendly neighborhood kirana store right it was our sucker it was our lifeline to food and to sanity and other things that we need in turn the lifeline for these saviors they were the consumer product companies right some of who uh, you see on our panel today and despite severe challenges these companies managed their businesses deftly and they ensured the supply of essentials to the country uh, the quarter one results which have been pouring in for some time now highlight uh, the resilience of uh, consumer goods companies in the face of these uh, great challenges you know most companies have seen traction as we were just talking about them also for their health hygiene and nutrition product lines and interestingly even jewelry demand has not crashed despite soaring prices perhaps because gold is so much uh, associated and uh, with the culture in india and has a social significance here overall consumer goods industries revenues and profits have improved in june july uh, despite uh, local uh, lockdowns that continue to create uncertainty there's also hope as analysts observe return of some discretionary demand Uh, so it's been five months into uh, this COVID nineteen crisis. What do you think has been the biggest disruption in your company, and what are the biggest lessons that you take away from that disruption? Yeah, I, I would believe uh, that from our perspective and our business perspective, there were two major disruptions. One is we have a very distributed supply chain. I mean, we are possibly one of the most spread out supply chain in the country, almost like an oil company. We have. 60 plants uh, servicing uh, literally in every state of india uh, that was one thing which really went down when when shutdown happened it was a disruption we are not planned for a situation where all plants get shut down i think the second big thing for us was more uh, the way the, our business is structured uh, i think uh, our business is structured to do most of it during the summer and number two on away from home outlets both these were the most impacted uh, one was the period was impacted and second was the away from home outlets really shut down and this was possibly something we never anticipated that there would be a 100% shutdown in the peak period with all the supply chain also so this was sort of in my view the most unexpected happening of of the so you know what if i were to chip into what uh, yes, mr krishna sure. kumar mentioned the seasonality aspect of uh, even for us in april we have akshay tritiya which is a very large uh, jewelry and gold buying festival and typically we are also start of the year with a launch of a new collection etc so very interestingly we had a host of products and inventory build up and and new collections uh, lined up uh, to be launched in in april and then in may again there was some there's a wedding season in may and june mm -hmm. so that entire piece i think the whole lockdown uh, created a short term disruptive impact uh, which of course is 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 restricted for the first quarter for us but nevertheless that is just something to chip into what seasonality he said uh, as well 
So one of the things actually, like KK said, uh, I think in-home consumption has been um, uh, a big challenge. And hence, you know, building, uh, sorry, rather in-home consumption has been good, but out of home consumption has been a huge challenge. And hence, uh, 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 one of the things that we have done just in the last two months is to launch cakes, which is a lot more in-home consumption to balance the portfolio that we have, where there's a lot of out and about impulse consumption for chocolates, for example, right? We are just test launching uh, uh, Bone Vita Fills, which is a center filled cereals in two states. We just did that three weeks ago. So I think some uh, intentional actions to see how we can balance the portfolio between in-home and out-of-home consumptions. I think building on what uh, Mr. Kumar said. The other thing that's happened to all of us is, you know, our license to operate got questioned. And there lies a huge learning. And I think, you know, the whole thing about saying then, managing this from the headquarter was not feasible. You had to get license to operate from 700 plus district magistrate and police commissioners, correct? Right? And hence, how do you build local empowerment? How do you transfer the capability of license to operate in the hands of the frontline sales team who have never done this in conventional FMCG companies, right? It's typically the factories and the government affairs department who do this at the headquarters. Uh, that has been a big, big revelation and possibly one of the biggest learnings going forward. Rajat, maybe you can tell us a little bit about, it's one thing to say that this is what companies should do and this is what consumers are saying. And it's another thing to do it, right? Uh, do you see in general, and I'm not talking specifically of the companies here in the panel today, but the, the industry in general, do you see them adapting properly and well overall to the pandemic? Have they got a good understanding of what to do in future if such a thing happens again? Look, it's a journey. Obviously, I, I think uh, things will evolve. Um, initially, when the whole pandemic started, uh, you know, the view was it will get over in one or two months. Uh, at that time, I remember there were a lot of projections that were given, uh, which were, uh, you know, that this will end in three months. And, you know, and I think somebody made a point uh, at the start uh, that basically it's impossible to predict uh, you know where when this will this whole thing will end. So I think if you see the last three to six months, three to five months, I would say the consumer goods companies have done, uh, I would say, well to adapt. Uh, I think going forward, uh, really, um, you know, I mean, since since we're discussing at a consumer level, I think we see primarily two mega trends which would be interesting to uh, you know to the extent what consumer goods companies respond. Some of them have responded. Some of them uh, are responding. One. I think which is also being mentioned by uh, several of the panelists, uh, what we call as decade of home. So, you know, are we really entering the decade of home? Uh, and therefore, should our entire, uh, you know, product portfolio, uh, the customer interactions, how should that be pivoted uh, towards, uh, you know, that particular mega trend? Uh, the second mega trend that we feel is really, uh, you know, at this point is uh, every business is a health business. So, uh, you know, while previously, you know, uh, there was clear thing and this goes beyond just consumer goods. So even, uh, you know, if you're going to a hotel, uh, even if you are, uh, you know, watching a movie, maybe in, in some distant future. So every business is becoming a health business. So these trends, if you like, are really impacting, uh, you know, uh, I would say uh, a lot of ways in which consumer goods companies, I think KK mentioned, everybody mentioned, you know, the focus on trying to, uh, you know, balance the portfolio uh, with in-home and out-home. And I guess, as I said, this is really work in progress. Uh, as Anurag said, there would be winners and losers. Uh, things are still evolving, but I think if, you know, uh, I think uh, really uh, what we feel is on these two trends, if the companies can sort of focus a bit more going forward, uh, I think uh, that that is something which you have to watch out for. But uh, I think dairy business largely being in very short shelf life categories, uh, we are in a, uh, in a very uh, extreme uh, industry where you have to tailor your demand to the daily, uh, tailor your supply to the daily demand. Uh, so it has to change every day. And that in itself is something which the dairy business is always used to. So, there's, uh, so we are relatively quick to adapt to dem demand changes. However, the point being made, uh, you know, with uh, the disruption in Horeca, hotels, restaurant, caterer segment, offices segment, uh, eating out, leisure consumption, that clearly has thrown all projections out of gear. Uh, and uh, I think uh, Deepak and uh, Mr. Krishna Kumar and Mr. Deepak mentioned 
that in-home consumption has gone up. So for us also, we find convenience foods going up. So ready to eat, ready to cook is going up. Uh, things which are easier to cook, paneer for example has gone up, ghee sale has gone up. Uh, but ice creams, beverages, buttermilk, lassi has really sh- dropped very sharply. Mm. So these are different trends uh, which are playing out differently in different industries. Real-time analytics and uh, investment in digital seem to be the, mo- the two most important threads of conversation. Uh, you think that is uh, what that should be more pronounced in organizations when uh, their uh, investments are concerned? In fact, we are implementing this across a few CPG companies where you can actually forecast at a distributor SPU level, outlet SPU level, what's the sales in this month? Now, that requires a, a, a machine learning algorithm that's learning all the time. So clearly, I think there is significant complexity that CPG industry has. So they're dealing with millions of consumers uh, with multiple transactions through the year. The frequency of purchase is not once in five years, it's like 10, 15, 20 times in a year and with millions of consumers. So clearly, I think uh, technology can play a big role. Uh, like Rajat said, it's already, this digital and analytics was already a trend pre-COVID. The need for it has only accelerated given the uncertainty that we are seeing now in our uh... Consumers are changing, consumers are more net savvy. Decision making is moving south in terms of age. Even the preteens are now influencing parents in terms of decision. And it is not only about the decisions to buy major stuff, but also, you know, what food you're going to keep at home, what they want to eat, what they don't want to eat, what watch they want to buy. Yeah, uh, the earrings that most boys sport these days, even the boys, right? <laughs> I would never imagine that. But uh, the point is that the consumer has been changing for some time and the internet and technology, more awareness, more exposure has made the consumer remarkably different from what uh, he or she was, you know, about five years ago. Now with the pandemic, everybody is at home. Everybody is on the phone. Everybody is on the computer, on the iPad, right? Everybody is on the net all the time, right? And all buying decisions are on the net, driven by that, driven by youngsters. What happens to consumer loyalty in this kind of scenario? What happens to brand positioning? Is the product more important than the message? Is brand loyalty more important than sales? You know, just uh, opportunistically taking a thing from the market and saying, okay, this thing is selling more. Let me just make a product and put it out there, right? What is your approach to the consumer today? I'm picking up a little bit from what uh, Rajat shared earlier and what you asked. I think uh, the first step that we had to take was to build a certain amount of customer confidence. Uh, So we anyway are an N equal to one business in the sense we have to sell a product to an individual, you know, it's a higher ticket value through retail stores. So we had the benefit of that piece. And in fact, during the months of April, uh, we did about half a million, what we call internally as empathy calls, just inquiring after our customers and saying, hope you're doing fine. Do you need any help? And if some of them had a milestone, like a birthday or an anniversary, we were able to wish them, uh, you know, also ask them, ask after them. We were not selling them anything. Some of them had golden harvest accounts, which were maturing. So we, we needed to tell them, if, do you want a refund? Do you want to hold on to it? Do you want to continue? So there were some natural conversations as well. But this happened by the army on the ground, you know, um, and it, it was phenomenal work while work from home. The second layer of uh, response that we found, in fact, uh, we we are a trusted brand and coming from Tata and you know Titan in a, in a largely unorganized space, we had the benefit. But I think people would anyway expect us to do the right thing and do it to a very high safety quotient. So we, we wanted to push ourselves to say, can we be the gold standard in safety? And how do we, you know, uh, picking up from this whole bit about every business is a health business. And why should I come out and buy and what will give me the confidence that your store is safe. So we actually went on a very hyper drive and it's an ongoing journey. Every day we are adding layers and layers of new thoughts in, in making it safer. So we said the safest stores in town and the safest workplaces, of course, but safest stores in town from a customer perspective. And that really uh, found, I mean, a lot of people, we were surprised. We were doing the right thing, but a lot of people came back and told us, 
you know this we have, we didn't feel safe in other stores we didn't feel as safe at home and therefore we are in the last few months realize it's become a competitive advantage mm -hmm. we were not expecting it but that's an outcome okay so i would like to say actually brand loyalty has got amped and multiplied during this period trust factor has gone up even more at least for for the category we are in people are saying you know i would rather go to somebody whom i know and who's trustworthy maybe it's the nature of the business or the retail service experience that is required the third thing that uh, we've been ramping up very quickly is this whole at home uh, purchase so you know and i know we will talk about digital but essentially going digital uh, even video calling even uh, reaching out to home try at home um, minimizing the time they need to spend in the store if at all they need to come to the store to to do the final check you know before they buy a 100000 rupee product or a 2 lakh rupee product or you know a larger set sometimes uh, and the fourth uh, dimension which i would like to say is that uh, we have been doing a lot of work as a brand in terms of kariger's wholesomeness authenticity of material sourcing from responsible sourcing of gold from the right mines lbma or even diamonds from the right kind of uh, site holders not blood diamonds not you know so there's a lot of work that goes on anyway in the background as an organized responsible player but we found that customers and purposeful and wholesome brands the research that we found and and what we heard the many voices saying i don't mind consuming but i think companies need need to take up their responsibility much more seriously it was already happening it's not something new i think millennials and a lot of younger people saying don't damage the planet you know government can't do everything but during this period even the purposefulness and purposeful consumption from wholesome brands is a, is a plank which is emerging it is not yet emerged i would say it depends on how in uh, independent players or marketers can actually leverage it in an authentic manner it's a very tricky one to do you can't just go out and say rara i'm doing all this right. you still need you need to do all that stuff and also tell the story in a meaningful not kind of a chest thumping kind of way it has to be very subtle so so to us uh, brand positioning is about right now being authentic as as authentic as we can be but mm -hmm. also in a nice way telling the story and keeping the customer as the center of what is it that is relevant for that customer you know uh, for some people it is assisted selling through video chats and for some digitally savvy it's about i don't mind just having a live chat with somebody who can help me out and for some others it is you know all that is fine you just send me the stuff home try at home so there's a whole continuum of customers with whom you need to serve them differently and also tell them different stories the advantage with digital is you can tell different stories to different cohorts and different segments uh, yeah. and 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 sustain that in a meaningful manner so that's the way we are looking at at the way brands are kind of uh, at, the, at the at the way in which we need to kind of talk to our customer a pandemic which has touched everybody but then there have been at least in the last 4 years there was something called a demonetization yeah which is also a very different kind of a pandemic right Which crippled us on a different sense. I mean, nobody had money, but nobody had cash, and how it hurt discretionary versus non-discretionary. We have had a huge regulatory change. We moved from some taxation to GST. Yes. We have had a transport of strike for eleven days. As a company, we went through a malware attack, and I think there are so in, in each of these five years, we can name at least one or two disruptions which could have blown a hole through your uh, business. So, uh, you know. I don't think we need to start now. We should have started some time back. And good companies would have known that today. You know, I think disruptions are here to stay. I'll just quote what I heard from Karim. Karim was the CEO uh, for uh, Google in Asia back uh, two years ago. We were there again for on a learning tour, and he said something very nice. He said, "The slowest pace of change you'll ever see in your life is what you're seeing today." So, what it meant is that if you believe this pandemic is the biggest thing you've seen in your life. it's possibly the most uh, i mean it's possibly the most docile thing that you possibly will ever see coming forward right now if you have that kind of a mindset then you will have to really really start preparing your business for this specifically can right. you change manufacturing yeah. footprints very easily in india unlikely your factories can you can just move factory from one city to the other is linked to the people employment there are unions there are exit losses there are authorities there are so many things 
it's not easy to put up a factory or exit one. The second one that you talked about, retail landscape. That is going through a tectonic change right now. Right? And then maybe that's a subject of discussion completely uh, separately. The third one is that you talked about uh, balancing your portfolio. It's huge. Today, one of the things that has saved us is our 5 rupee and 10 rupee portfolio, which for chocolates as an industry is more than 50%. And today, what we are seeing is actually a double-digit growth in this portfolio. Mm -hmm. So, so if you if you look at what's happened, you see, if you didn't have a balanced portfolio, which talked, which offered a premium offering like silk for festivals like Valentine, and we come back with a recent campaign saying, you know, after all this COVID, we are meeting each other now. So there's a I miss you bar that we have come up with on our silk. You know, so currently, uh, or I very innovative. <laughs> That's probably the right thing to do now for the brand because it's all about, you know, love. And so that's what the team yeah. meant. And then we have the five rupee and 10 rupee, five star, perk, gems, Cadbury dairy milk. We have the one rupee chocolate, salts, the two rupee Cadbury shots. Correct? These are extremely important. And then you have the mainstream brands, which is a 20 rupee, five star, 20 rupee CDM. You need to have a balanced portfolio. The other imbalance that's there in our portfolio, overall, we're okay because we have biscuits and bone beta, which is in home, half of chocolates in home something is outside but i think we need to build that more in home especially on on chocolates right. and, and especially with items like you know cakes and bonita fills right so i think it's a and you can't do it overnight i think building brands and products and portfolio take a long time so, so uh, it's a journey but i think uh, we are wiser for what I mean, in hindsight, we all have 2020 vision, right? So, uh, because people, uh, because of the pandemic acting as a cast catalyst, have started mm -hmm. really using this as a as as an opportunity to really transact. So, whether it is the consumer or even the retailer, I think you find uh, more and more uh, uh, demand coming through the e-commerce space. So, uh, I think the fact was this was anticipated. It is just that it has got catalyzed during this period. Companies like us, we were preparing for this. We had our own engagement uh, site called Coco, and now we have really uh, looped in into every single e-commerce uh, platform. See, the idea is now every company in the FMCG space to have, have a clear, holistic, strategic thought process of how this channel will work and how will it work with causing least disruption to the existing channels because India has a big brick and mortar uh, uh, approach to business, which, which employs a lot of people. I mean, so. We need to be really quick on it, but at the same time, very really finely balance it with what we have so that it is accretive and not uh, completely uh, destroys the other one. So it's going to be a tightrope walk for some time till we see how this scales up post COVID also. I think the first thing that came across, at least to me, was to look at how do you sort of have a more balanced portfolio. Uh, given the whole changing, uh, you know, consumer uh, behaviors during this pandemic and making the portfolio more resilient. Uh, so I guess that's something which, uh, you know, at least came across uh, multiple points that everybody made. The interesting thing was that, uh, you know, there is a greater focus on new product launches to um, ensure that uh, and how companies have been able to do it was very interesting during this particular pandemic. So that's one uh, key takeaway that, you know, I had from this conversation. The second was really... Uh, you know, obviously, uh, this pandemic, uh, you know, threw in uh, huge challenges on supply chain. So how do you make for your uh, supply chain more future ready, more resilient, uh, maybe enable bit, a bit more redundancy uh, in the system, uh, more responsive? Uh, and I think the interesting example uh, which Ajoy gave was, you know, how to take some of the work around artisans, etc., uh, to, to, to where they live. Uh, I think the Project M would be very interesting to see how that one evolves. Uh, but that was the second thing uh, sort of, uh, you know, uh, was very interesting to uh, look at and get feedback on. I think the third really around the brand, I think uh, it was very clear, the panel's view that, you know, brands uh, are for long term and therefore one should not uh, tinker around with their positioning. But I think what equally also came out is that maybe it's also a good time to uh, sort of strengthen the messages around brand values, around purpose, more responsible, uh, and those type of cues, uh, the companies would be better served if they were to, uh, you know, sort of uh, go there. Uh, I think digital commerce, the e-commerce, I think seemed like a no-brainer, and I think everybody seems to be thinking about it. I think uh, Raj mentioned that there could be uh, various uh, flavors to it, and I couldn't agree more uh, on that particular aspect. 
And I think again, uh, digital, obviously, um, I think everybody thinking about it, but uh, you know, I, I suppose uh, the sense I got is that maybe everybody uh, has their own sort of, uh, you know, priority, uh, but maybe uh, there could be, um, there could be, uh, uh, you know, there could be an opportunity to look at uh, the whole uh, aspect of, uh, you know, um, analytics and whole aspect of data, which I think everybody seems to uh, agree with. Uh, but that's another area which sort of everybody could, you know, maybe, and as, as we discussed, it's, it is a continuous process, but people could look at even more.